Good morning, ladies. We are continuing this week in Acts 4, where we've been the last two weeks uh, as the the church began to grow and just multitudes of uh, men and women coming to Christ in that time period when following Peter and John's dramatic healing of a man who had been crippled since birth. Right there on the temple uh, gate, the gate called Beautiful, it was just a dramatic and beautiful healing of a man, both physically and spiritually. As a result of that incredible sign and wonder which God performed through Peter and John. Peter was able to preach, and possibly John was preaching at the same time, but but the preaching resulted in large numbers being added to the group that day. There was uh, some pushback from the religious leaders of that day, and Peter and John ended up spending a night in jail for all of their good good preaching. That whole dramatic scene culminated with them being ordered to not speak again in the name of Jesus. Of course, Peter said, judge for yourself whether it we should or shouldn't, but we can't help but speak in the name of Jesus Christ. We cannot help but obey God. God had called them to this particular job of preaching the gospel and to disobey that would have been um, worse than civil disobedience. So we uh, saw as we ended the lesson last week that the people were praising God. They were uh, committed, recommitting themselves to more boldness, uh, to asking God for more signs and wonders to be done among the people so that more and more people would come to know Jesus Christ. So we had we ended last week with just this beautiful praise and worship session where they uh, the people are charged up to continue. Now, the transition from that to, to this week's lesson, we don't know if there was a time frame of a few hours or a few days, because it begins with just a description in Acts 4.32 of how the people were operating as believers. And it's a beautiful, really, really um, incredible explanation of how they managed to take care of each other during this period of time when so many foreigners were in Jerusalem. So let me start at verse 32 and read through the end of this chapter. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds to what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, He sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. What an interesting uh, lifestyle these earliest Christians adopted. And I don't want to be a cynic, but, you know, this may be the last time a group of Christians were ever described in these glowing terms. Well, I would actually be wrong. I want you to listen to this story that I found this week. Newsman Clarence W. Hall followed American troops through Okinawa in 1945. He and his Jeep driver came upon a small town that stood out as a beautiful example of a Christian community. He wrote, quote, We had seen other Okinawan villages down at the hills and despairing. By contrast, this one shone like a diamond in a dung heap. 
Everywhere we were greeted by smiles and dignified bows. Proudly, the old men showed us their spotless homes, their terraced fields, their storehouses and granaries, even their prized sugar mill. Hall saw saw no jails, no drunkenness, and divorce was unknown. He learned that an American missionary had come there 30 years earlier. That would have been 1915. While he was in the village, he had led two elderly townspeople to Christ and left them with a Japanese Bible. These new believers studied the scriptures and started leading their fellow villagers to Jesus. Hall's Jeep driver said he was amazed at the difference between this village and the others around it. He remarked, So this is what comes out of only a Bible and a couple of old guys who wanted to live like Jesus. You know, the great power of God's Word leads to salvation through faith in Christ, creating a special community, a community of believers who love one another, exhort one another, and serve God together. Ladies, we need to pray that our churches will be a similar example of God's power to a very cynical and very critical watching world. Now back to our passage today. I love that it, uh, Luke tells us, uh, he mentions that they're sharing everything that they had, um, every, they had everything in common. But what I really love so much is in verse 33, great grace was upon them all. You know, we see this in different time situations with the people of God, whether it's in the Old Testament and the people of God are experiencing great grace because of their confidence in God, because of their dependence on God and their faith. Their faith is strong, and as a result of their faith being so strong, they experience the great grace of God. And they and I'm wondering what does that look like because I don't I don't see it today. What does it look like to have great grace? Um, and I think it it's it's described in this story of the village in Okinawa, or the story of what's happening here in Acts four, where people are so in love with God, so in love with Jesus, that it affects every relationship that they have. It affects how they, um, their, their morality. It affects so much of their lives that they live just as beautifully together as the people in this Okinawan village. I would love to know how that village is doing today. So, um, they had all things in common as it tells us in this uh, passage, Acts 4, 32. They recognized that God owns everything. It, it all belongs to God and to his people. And because God had touched their lives so deeply, they found it quite easy to share all their things. It was a, it was beautiful. Now it is not accurate to see that this see this is an early form of communism. Communism is not quantania. Communism says, what is yours is mine. I'll take it. Quantania says, what is mine is yours. I'll share it. Quantania is what great grace among God's people looks like. It's a Greek word that that just describes this church that we are um, viewing today in Acts 4.32. A, a, a such a deep concern for one another that it just results in sharing everything. Now, unfortunately, this generosity of the early Christians began to be abused. Later, the Apostle Paul taught um, the people regarding who should be helped and how they should be helped. Paul's directions were that the church must discern who the truly needy are. 
You can find that in 1 Timothy 5, 3. Uh, By the way, all of these passages are in the notes that um, you can go to the notes uh, that are were sent to you in an email earlier this week, and you can find all these passages. But if you want to jot them down, now you can. But the first one, the church, the church must discern who the truly needy are. First Timothy five three. The second one, if one can work to support himself, he is not truly needy and must provide for his own needs. You can find that in Second Thessalonians three, ten through twelve. 1 Timothy 5, 8, and 1 Thessalonians 4, um, verse 11. Then the number the th- number three in the list, if a family can support a needy person, the church should not support them. And I know that um, that's so- certainly a pr- issue that churches find today. Uh, uh, yesterday, I, I wasn't aware of this, but yesterday I was speaking with a woman who is very active in some um, organizations within our valley here that try to help the needy, and churches are are faced with a lot of needy people who have family right here, and the family refuses to support the, the needy person. So that's that's a real problem because it leaves the church in the position of helping someone really sort of against Scripture's dictates. But that's f- found in 1 Timothy 5, 3, and 4. If supported by the church, he must make some return to the church body. 1 Timothy 5, 5, and verse 10, which is basically just saying that um, it's, it's really focused on widows uh, saying that regardless of whether you're an old lady or if you are an uh, a, some per, a person of any particular age, if the church is supporting you, you need to do something in return uh, for the church body in some way, um, whether it's cleaning um, or, or doing some service that would take the load off of the the leadership. Um, one, two more. It is right for the church to examine moral conduct before giving support. That's found in First Timothy five nine through thirteen. Now that one would. I, I'm not sure anybody would even agree to that one anymore, um, even even in the churches themselves. But Scripture gives the church the right to examine the moral conduct of the needy person before giving them any support. Uh, Finally, the support of the church should be for the most basic necessities of living. Um, In other words, if they need a vehicle, then a a very basic vehicle is just fine. They don't need a Mercedes. Uh, And that's 1 Timothy 6, verse 8. Uh, And then finally in this passage, we're introduced to this man named Barnabas for the first time. You know, I'm sure that you've seen him many times in the book of Acts uh, from how wonderfully he mentored a young man named John Mark, as well as another young man named Saul, whose name was um, God changed to Paul. You know, the, the apostles nicknamed this Cypriot Christian Barnabas, because he was such an encouraging sort of guy. He paid attention to the needs of others, not just financially as in this passage, but also those who were struggling in their faith or with being misunderstood, as was the case uh, with John Mark and with Paul. Uh, But in, in this instance, he's an encourager in that he saw that his own real estate, uh, his own real estate belongs to God. And since there were needs among God's people, he sold it and brought the money to the apostles to feed the hungry Christians. Now, one other word about the context here. I uh, learned as I was studying this week something that I had never thought about before. It appears that this bringing the money to the apostles, this handing it over that Barnabas is doing, is done in public. 
Um, we don't know for sure, but we do know that they were all living together at, um, under Solomon's portico. It is an in, it was. It's, it's no longer there. This is from the days of Herod, uh, the temple that Herod built, and it was it was incredibly huge. Um, and this section of the outer wall that is called Solomon's Portico is a covered area adjacent to the wall that is so large. It's the uh, it's the equivalent of four football fields. Okay, if you can picture that kind of lined up, I, I'm picturing it lined up end to end because it is it stretches the length of the wall. So that's how thousands of people are able to kind of hunker down and find a place where they can be together and have it share everything in common. It's not like you had um, that many people living within the city gates. Uh, that that's that's impossible. They were coming from all of the re- surrounding regions around Jerusalem uh, ever since Pentecost, and they're living together, sharing all things in common. And so it's it's almost as though they had a worship twenty four seven because they were all together, and I'm sure they were worshiping God spontaneously in small groups as well as in large groups. And so the the idea here in Barnabas bringing his, selling his land and bringing the um, proceeds of that sale to the apostles is that it wasn't private. It was probably noticed by a lot of other people. A lot of other Christians saw what happened. So as we transition now into to chapter 5, the same can be said. Nothing has changed. The, the setting hasn't changed. They're still in Solomon's portico where we have um, this other man and his wife, Ananias and Sapphira, similarly bringing the proceeds from the sale of uh, a piece of land. We'll find out that it was only a partial uh, gift, but they're bringing it um, and most likely publicly, most likely people were there observing what was going on. Because uh, just to give you a hint, that was in the mind of Ananias and Sapphira, that they would be admired for what they were doing. So let me read. I'm going to read uh, one through six. My, but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Just let me just interrupt one second. There's nothing wrong with doing that, okay? There was no rule. There were no uh, demands made on the people to do what they did, um, to to bring, to to even sell your property. There was no demand. This was something that God put on the person's heart. And they could do with it what they wanted to. All right, verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. So do you see that Peter is very much aware? How does he know? How does Peter know that Ananias is lying, is being deceptive? Well, he has been given a word of knowledge. Uh, you can find scripture about that in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that lists the spiritual gifts. A word of knowledge is where God gives a person 
information that they would not have had otherwise. They would not have known this because this was done privately. This, um, um, this agreement between Ananias and Sapphira to lie was done privately, but publicly Peter is, um, is, an, is calling on them to be honest about it. Now, um, the word here for kept back that Peter uses is a Greek word that I would have a hard time pronouncing. I'll give it a shot. Nosphizome, and it means to misappropriate. Now, you've heard the term misappropriation of funds. Well, the only reason this is a misappropriation of funds is because they're lying about it. Um, it would have been perfectly fine. Say they got a thousand dollars for the for the piece of land, and say they want to give half of it to the church for the common good of all the people. No problem. That is not a problem to do that. The problem is that they did it. They made that decision in their own hearts but lied and, and, and told the, the apostles that they had sold the property and were bringing the entire proceeds to the church. So obviously it's a serious issue to lie to the Holy Spirit. You're lying. And, and Peter doesn't say you lied to me, you lied to the church. He says you lied to God. The Holy Spirit is God, and you lied to God. You are in danger. When we lie to God, we are in danger. Uh, it, and, 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 you know, I've been thinking about this now for several days. If When we lie to anybody, we're lying to God. You know, it's not like some of our lies are just to a person, and other lies are to God. All sin is ultimately against God. And so lying is a very dangerous thing to do. It is a very serious thing to do. And I'll also comment here that the, um, the church was in such a unique situation. The people of God are ex- enjoying that abundant, great grace. And this is a time period when the the work of God is so obvious with with m- so much healing, so much signs and wonders uh, that that it's a unique period of history for the church, similar to when the Israelites finally, after forty years, crossed over into the promised land, and God's power working among the people against in, in, in defeating the enemies and bringing great plunder uh, to the Israelites, it was a phenomenal period in their history. And so we learn in um, the book of Joshua that a man named Achan kept back, and actually it's the same ancient Greek word that's used here in the book of Acts uh, for lying to God because he kept back, he misappropriated funds in that he kept back some of the spoils for himself and didn't turn it over to the leadership. Now, um, that word, the only other time it's used in Scripture is found in Titus 2.10, and it means to steal. Now, um, it, it, you know, one of the commentaries said that in both of these situations, Achan in the book of Joshua and Ananias here in Acts, this act of deceit interrupts the victorious progress of the people of God. You know, the, there was such great joy, such great grace in both of these scenes that for this deception to take place, this uh, uh, commentary says it interrupts the victorious process or progress 
of the people of God. So a very, very dangerous thing that happened there in those unique times. So when Peter saw us said this about um, when Peter uh, stated that he knew what Ananias had done, Ananias must have been crushed. You, you, would, you would know that he expected praise for this spectacular gift because he had seen how um, people treated Barnabas. And so he was expecting the same treatment, but he got rebuked instead. And, and Peter really called a spade a spade here because he said he saw that Satan was at work, even through a man numbered among believers like Ananias. So we see pride, we see hypocrisy in this believer. You know, spiritual pride and hypocrisy was what Jesus hammered the Jewish religious leaders about. And, you know, when he called them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Um, So because this sin was a lusting after public praise for his generosity, it was appropriate that the sin be exposed publicly. John Stott, a very famous pastor of times past, said it is a good general rule that secret sins be dealt with secretly, that private sins be dealt with privately, and only public sins publicly. And so that is exactly what happened here for, to Ananias. One other comment on Satan filling the heart of a believer Satan can influence the life of a believer, even a spirit-filled believer, but he can't do your sinning for you, okay? It can't do my sinning for me. He can give me an idea, and he plants ideas in believers' hearts all day long. But I am the one who is responsible for him, for for my own sin if I conceive in my heart to go ahead and carry out a sinful thought that is put there by the devil. Now, when Ananias dropped dead, I believe that Peter was probably more surprised than anyone else. You know, notice that Peter said nothing to Ananias about judgment or death. So this death sentence was not a calling down of a curse or anything um, by Peter, or or it wasn't anything of establishing some kind of doctrinal um, uh, action for the future uh, from an ecclesiastical official. The death of Ananias was solely an act of God. It wasn't anything that Peter did. And I, and I do believe that Peter was just as surprised as anyone in the crowd as that happened. You know, the Bible speaks of sin that leads to death. And the context is Christians who sin. One passage is in 1 Corinthians 11, 27, and thir- 27 to 30. And it's speaking of taking the Lord's Supper while living a lie and living in blatant, unconfessed sin. Let me read that. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep or died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. Now, um, this passage is used, uh, in at least in, in the church that I attend, it's used um, every single Sunday morning before we take the Lord's Supper. Um, not the whole passage, but we are reminded uh, by our pastor that examine yourself because 
if we take partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily, and unworthily means that we are participating in something that is sacred, something that is so full of rich meaning, the body and blood of Jesus sacrificed on the cross for us, that if we do that without examining our hearts, confessing our sins, um, you know, we're in danger of judgment. Paul tells us in this passage that it could be the reason some people are sick. Now, Obviously, that is not the reason for all sickness, so don't take that, take it that way. That would not be the case. But he is suggesting to us, or really stating truth, that sickness within the church body needs to be examined to see if there's some kind of unconfessed sin and the person refusing to confess it, but yet going on and taking, partaking in the Lord's Supper. It's a dangerous thing to do because he says, uh, some of you are sick, some of you have actually died. So just a word of warning, we do not take flippantly our worship of Jesus Christ in the church. We uh, must take it seriously. We're going to mention that again in a minute. There's another passage in 1 John uh, 5, 16 that that mentions um, a sin unto death. And, you know, the the idea here is not that a Christian isn't going to sin. A Christian will sin. We all still sin. The idea is confess it. Don't let yourself get caught in a habitual sin that is not confessed and um, um, repented of because your life could be cut short. You'll still go to heaven, okay? You're not going to lose your salvation, but God could could kind of get fed up uh, with the person who has not repented of a habitual sin. Now let's see what happens with... Um, We haven't seen anything yet of his wife. So let's see what happens in verse 7. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. In other words, he gave her a, a, a price. And she said, Yes, for this price. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell dead at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Verse 11, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. And I hope you've noticed that that great fear is mentioned um, in when Ananias died, verse 5, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. And now it's mentioned again that great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. I don't understand or or know why she uh, was not around to be with Ananias when this happened earlier, um, three hours earlier. I have no explanation for that, and I didn't see any kind of explanation in any of the commentaries. But I I just was amazed by that. I found that interesting. But she did, in fact... um, clearly cook up this scheme with her husband. Um, You know, this was not something that the husband forced the wife to do. God knows the hearts of wives who have been coerced into doing something sinful. And I believe he judges that wife differently. He is so full of mercy and his wisdom is beyond our understanding. But I, I don't believe that she would have dropped dead if she had not been complicit. 
if she had not gone along with her husband um, in this plan. And so, um, you know, Scripture makes it clear that s- submitting to uh, the authority, any, any God-given authority, has its limits um, when the person is being forced to go along with sin. Okay, now I want to just think back for a second to Barnabas and his generous heart. What did his action tell us about his relationship with God? What does generosity say about a person's faith and trust in God? Well, it says everything. A person with a generous heart who gives their everything without any, without holding back, that that person knows and trusts God to be their provider, to pr- provide everything they need. And so, so they can be so open-handed. In contrast, what can we infer about the faith of Ananias and Sapphira? Well, they, they didn't trust God to, to provide for them. They felt like it was important for them to squirrel away some of the money for later. And again, I want to remind you, that would be fine. It would not have been against anything that the church was mandating because the church wasn't mandating anything to the people about giving giving away everything you have. This was the Spirit of God working in people's hearts to be generous. So, you know, it's fine to store away. That's a very wise thing to do. We see it in the book of Proverbs. But to say that you are giving it all in order to get people to be impressed with what you're doing is the tr- is the where the uh, this couple Ananias and Sapphira got in trouble. Now I want to mention this great fear that comes upon the church as a result of this. Uh, <clears throat> the word phobos, the Greek word phobos, can mean reverence, as in holy awe, and that is kind of how we use the f- word phobos when we say the fear of God. We're saying that this person reverences, reveres God. They have awe of who he is and his holiness and his righteousness and his purity and his power. But in the context of this story of how the word phobos is being used, I think that it also carries, it is, it is what we've already said, that, that holy awe, but it also carries an element of dread or terror produced by the judgment of God. First Peter in First Peter um, four seventeen, he tells us, "For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. And if God and if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news?" So you see that this great fear is a, uh, a type of fear that understands that the judgment of God is coming. Um, we in the church today need to understand that God will only withhold his judgment for so long. Um, and so I just wonder how an increase in fearing the Lord would affect our churches today. Now, let me finish this passage um, with uh, verses 12 through 16, and then we'll be done. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared to join them. Now, that would be the non-Christians that are are, um, onlookers to what's going on. They didn't dare join them, but they held them in high esteem. Interesting, isn't it? 
And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Wow. This... this mass of people that are gathered together at Solomon's portico is growing daily. Some are just curious. They're just onlookers. Um, Others are joining their group, multitudes of people joining their group. Now, this was really all that they're, all that they're experiencing and seeing is in answer to the prayer that they had prayed In chapter 4, 29 and 30, they had prayed for God to do great signs and wonders. And their prayer is definitely being answered. Um, On this verse 13, where it said, None of the rest dared to join them, but held them in high esteem. uh, Vance Havner uh, commented on this attitude of the non-believers as they are observing what is going on among the early church. He said, people didn't join this church carelessly. They were afraid to. There was a holy awe that kept Tom, Dick, and Harry at a distance. People didn't rush into this fellowship just because it was the nice thing to do. It meant something to unite with this crowd. There was a holy repulsion And I know of nothing that the church needs more today. It is the last thing that we think we need. We're always trying to attract. Our programs, our prizes, picnics, and pulpit pyrotechnics are aimed at drawing the people in. Here was a church that made people stand back. We have catered to the world. We have let the world slap the church on the back in coarse familiarity. Here was a church that prospered by repelling. You will observe that all of this followed on the heels of the death of Ananias and Sapphira. What a sobering, sobering indictment against the church today. I don't know about you, but I was raised in a day and time when the church was called the sanctuary, the house of God, that it was you you didn't bring food and drink into the church. You didn't, children were not allowed to run in church. And, you know, I'm not saying that that was good and now we're wrong um, necessarily, but boy, has there been a lack of awe and respect for the church, even among the church people. And so I'm not sure what we should do about it, um, that is that is between church leaders and God Himself, but I, I was, it, this week it reminded me of something that I've observed in the church we attend. Um, from the opening passage of praise and worship at, in, in, at the beginning of our services until the closing hymn. Not one word is said that isn't part of the praise and worship of God. Announcements are made before the service starts or after the service is over. Um, There are no um, special uh, kinds of extraneous movements or actions or words. It's all very, very scripted. And for a lot of people, that would be a little, maybe, I don't know, um, not very entertaining, not very comfortable. I think the intention and purpose is to make the Sunday morning worship service more worshipful, to instill a little bit of the fear of God in us. And I'm okay with that. Um, I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. I'm just saying it works for me. 
And so that is just something to con- that maybe all of us should consider as we experience church together. Um, how wh- have we become flippant and casual about how we gather to worship God? Um, that is that is the, it for today's lesson. Um, I am hoping that you ha- are enjoying this look at world changers. World changers become a possi- possibility for us as the power of God falls on us and we move forth in the fear of the Lord. I'll see you next week.